good afternoon, everybody. Everybody seems to be very punctual today. Uh, it's just quarter to now, and uh, just like to welcome you all here to the Common Memorial Church of the, of the Holy Cross here in Carsavin. And it's uh, we are very honoured to have the, this talk here this afternoon. And I welcome our Bishop, Bishop Ray Brown, who's here with us. And thank you, Bishop Ray, for giving up your day and spending it here in Carsavin with all of us here. And I suppose, and with him here is our Father Padraig Shukro. I think, you know, he celebrated his 80th birthday recently and he's getting better with age. So, you know, and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Marish Brick is no stranger to any of you. As you know, he's a native here of Car He has a huge interest in Car He has written extens extensively about Car and the history of Car through the years. And he has always had a huge interest in this church too, the O'Connell Memorial Church. And I think you, you probably all know by now, he's currently writing a book on the history of the town. And this afternoon's talk here in the church is taking place here in the church very appropriately because the lecture is about the church and how it came to be. And we often wonder how come such a marvelous building could be built here that long ago and when people were so poor in, the, in both here in Kerry and indeed all over the world. Um, Marish Brick uh, will not be taking any questions after the talk, but he, he will be available to discuss any questions that you have later. So again, I welcome, I welcome him here, and he's, he's a retired professor, I think, of history in UCD, and I'd like you now to put your hands together and give a very warm welcome to Professor Marish Brick. I'm going to begin with the usual request to uh, have you put your mobiles on silent or switch them off if you don't mind, thank you. Um, um, can I begin by thanking Father Larry for his introduction and also I should say um, for his support, the support he's given to the Daniel O'Connell School since it was inaugurated uh, 10 years ago. And also I should add my thanks to Father Sugaru who has also attended all of our sessions I think over the last 10 years. And while I'm at it, by no means least, I'd also like to recognize the Bishop of Kerry, Bishop Ray Brown. Uh, some of you may remember that um, Bishop Ray was consecrated as Bishop of Kerry in July 2013, about three weeks before we held our first school. So Bishop Ray is also celebrating an anniversary and our best wishes to him on surviving <laughs> his residence among him for the last uh, 10 years. He also has been a great attender of our school has attended I think all of our sessions particularly those in Derry Nan and uh, we sent him our best wishes and uh, we thank him for his support as I've said so thank you very much I think I should like to give them a round of applause if you don't mind. <coughs> support is very important in enterprises like this. Um, I also should mention that I remember when I talked to Father Larry about doing this a few weeks ago I didn't know at the time, but I've known since, that um, this is actually the 200th year, 200 year anniversary of the birth of Canon Timothy Brosnan, who was the man who was largely responsible for building this church. So I remember him today. I have a lot to say about him. But I also would like to acknowledge or recognize some of his family who may be in the congregation. I didn't get a chance to meet them, but I know that if they're not here, they certainly are watching on, online. And in particular, I'd like to uh, uh, recognize uh, Mrs. Mary Brosnan from Tullig in uh, Castle Island, who lives in the ancestral home of uh, uh, Canon Brosnan. And also at the risk of causing him great embarrassment, I'd also like to send my best wishes to her grandson, Owen, who joined the Dominicans about three or four weeks ago. So I wish him well in his uh, missionary, mi mission. I wish him well in his uh, um, time as an um, uh, OP, uh, and I wish him uh, every blessing in his uh, life ahead. Um, so having gone through all those uh, preliminaries, 
Um, and let me begin by making a very obvious point, and it is this, that by any standard, sorry, I have a bad back, so I have to sit down a bit. Um, let me begin, as I said, by making an obvious point, which is this, that by any standards, this is um, a, a, an impressive building. Uh, but having said that, it was always intended to be a, an impressive building, to be an impressive tribute to um, Daniel O'Connell, whose campaigns, of course, led to the emancipation of Irish and indeed English Catholics in 1829, their emancipation from the last of the penal laws. Can I just stop myself here a second? This isn't echoing out there anyway. Can you hear me okay? Is it, is it awkward? Is it, you can hear, is it okay, is it? Okay, fine. Is it okay? You can't hear. Can you hear, Joe? It's not great. Hold on a second. Now. Maybe if I stand back a bit. Is that better? Hmm? Is that better? Pardon? You want me to stand at the altar? My God, that's a promotion. <laughs> I'm game if you are. <laughs> okay. Let's try that because. Let me try the altar then. What? Yeah, okay. This is even better than because I, I don't want to be on the altar. Okay. Okay. All right. Be most if you can. <coughs> see how to see that. Uh, is that better? Okay, thank you. All right, very good. I wouldn't want anybody to miss my pearls of wisdom. Um, uh, now, as I said, uh, this particular, is that better? It's okay? Okay. This uh, particular church, as I said, was always intended to be impressive um, uh, as a tribute to Daniel O'Connell, the man who led the campaign for Catholic emancipation in 1829. Um, now, I accept that Catholic emancipation is a complicated topic at the best of times, uh, especially because I'm conscious that there are a lot of people, or there are a few people in the audience anyway who know a lot about this. But let me just say that for my purposes here this afternoon, what Catholic emancipation meant was that it gave Catholics the right to sit in Parliament, the House of Commons and in the House of Lords. But more crucially and beyond that, and this is the important point, is that it gave Catholics the opportunity and the right by sitting in Parliament, the right to influence how the laws of the land were shaped, how they were discussed, and ultimately how they were passed into law. In a country, I might add, where the head of state was still the head of the Anglican Church, and whose ethos and traditions had been shaped by that church. In other words, in that kind of state, Catholics were no longer regarded as outsiders, at least from a legal point of view. They weren't regarded as suspect citizens, if you like, who had nothing else on their minds than the overthrow of the state and the end of the established church. They were trusted, if I can use that word, to participate in the debate on what was best for society and even to shepherd it into law. Now, I'm not, of course, suggesting that as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, as opposed to a matter of law, that the historical baggage and prejudices of the past remained in the past. But for Catholics, emancipation had completely reinvented how citizenship and the rights of citizens were viewed. And of course, Daniel O'Connell was the man who made all of that possible. I'm still not, Mary, you're still not? Am I still? I'll give you a synopsis afterwards, Mary. <laughs> 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 so as I said, because O'Connell was the person who was deemed to have broken that mold um, and to have made all of this possible, hence this impressive tribute. This was to be the tribute that was to reflect how revolutionary O'Connell's achievement was. For all that, however, and for all the desire to salute Daniel O'Connell as a, a national figure and to have this monument dedicated to him, this church was and still is essentially a parish church. So to that extent, it is no different, for example, from the church in Glenbay, which was consecrated in 1882, 
or the church in Kilorglan, which was consecrated in 1891, or the church in Milltown that was consecrated in 1834. Now, I could add several other examples to this list, but they would simply reinforce rather than to make the point. And my point is this, that during the last 30 or 40 years of the 19th century, the construction of a number of churches such as this, which had been deferred by the Great Famine and its aftermath, were now being planned, refurbished, and built right across the diocese. So in other words, this church, as great as its purpose was, and as important as its purpose was to recognize O'Connell, this church was only one among a number of others. Having said all that, and having referred to the building spree of the last years of the 19th century, it was not the best time to be building churches or building schools. And indeed, when Father Timothy Brosnan arrived here as parish priest from Ballymagelligat in March 1879, he arrived not with a set of plans for a new parish church in his back pocket, but to face the distress of the famine of 1879, 1880, and 1881. I mention this because I want to stress that although Cahars had been badly needed a new parish church at the time, um, the parish and indeed the diocese had very few resources to provide, had to, pro to provide one. And certainly it did not have the resources to fund on its own a national monument to O'Connell, however great and glorious he was supposed to have been. Now at the time, the parish church in Cahars stood out there to the, to the right of where you're sitting, at the, over there. It, was, it has been knocked down, of course, since, but that's where the old parish uh, church was from the 1820s until this church was opened for its first mass in 1902. Before the 1820s, the um, congregation, such as it was in Carsevine, went to the old penal church, um, which stood on the western side of the car park, and thanks to the efforts of the late Geoffrey O'Connor, whom I also remember here this afternoon, it is of course still there. It was the penal church where O'Connell was baptized. But of course, when you talk about the penal church, as we call it here, you're talking about a church in a town which had relatively few people, because in 1815, for example, what would become the town of Carcevine was said to consist of no more than five houses. So it was a small place, and the penal church served its needs. But having said that, after 1815, the town of Carcevine grew spectacularly, largely because it was identified by the government as a post town, as a place where a new court system would be established, where there would be a base for revenue officers, customs officers, policemen, and so forth. It would be the entrepreneur, the metropolis, if you like, of South Kerry. And indeed, this was reflected in the censuses. In the census of 1821, for example, bearing in mind now that in 1815, we know that there were only five houses there. But by 1821, the population had jumped to 205 and the number of houses to 36. By 1831, that's 10 years later, the population had increased to nearly 1,200 and the number of houses to 189. So therefore, it was clear that with such a remarkable level of growth, that the existing penal church was not fit for purpose. And indeed, visitors who came to Carcevine during 1821 and 1822, and there are a few accounts survive, they refer to the uh, old penal church and to the services of the old penal church and to the fact that most of the congregation had to listen to mass on the outside rather than on the inside and in all types of weather. So there was clearly a demand for a, a new church. Now, Daniel O'Connell was the landlord at the time, and he had his own ideas about this new church and about, about where it should be built and what form it should take. And O'Connell wanted the new Catholic church for the parish to be the centerpiece of a new town which he was planning on his own ancestral estate in Carn, which is in the eastern part of the town. And O'Connell, of course, not only wanted to build his new town on his own ancestral lands, but he also wanted the church to be a centerpiece of that town. You see, the town, and this remained the case until the 1920s, the town was, at that time, and until the 1920s, as I've said, was part of the estate of Trinity College. And even though O'Connell leased it for a while, the ultimate owners were Trinity College. He, and he did not want the new town, and certainly didn't want a Catholic church to be built on land that was owned by Trinity. So he had this plan, as I said, to build a new town in Cairn, and the center part of it would be the um, church. 
And this would be something that would be planned and developed and overseen by his family. Now, we know that for all the uh, ambitions of O'Connell, that the, in fact the, tr the town was never relocated uh, over to Cairn, and there are a number of reasons for that, which I'll mention in a moment. But we do know that there was an attempt made to build the church. Now, pardon to my visitors who I'll be referring to some places which are very familiar to me, uh, and, uh, but uh, which won't be to our visitors. But I hope you will forgive me, but it would just be too complicated to be explaining where they are in relation to one another. But anyway, the, the, we know from maps of the 1830s and 1840s, for example, if you look at maps of the 1830s, and 1840s, it's quite clear that there was a church in Rhinochin down where, below where the mart is now. And that, of course, even though it was never completed, it was actually built to about 15 or 16 feet from the ground. So he, it actually, it was, an attempt was made uh, to build that church uh, in Ocon on O'Connell's land. Uh, there was a school built there, and uh, those of you, certainly uh, you people here won't remember it, but certainly their grandparents would have attended the school in Tcarn, which was built at this new town. It was there near Paddy Court, uh, near um, Courtney's garage there. Some of you may, I can remember the ruins of it when I was growing up myself. That was there. It remained a, a school until, as I said, the early 20th century. The, there was a presbytery built out there. The priests of the town lived on the Carn side of the old road, until the 1860s. It was only in the 1860s that the priest moved in here and built um, a, a presbytery here, first of all down in Key Street, and then of course where it is now. So as I've said, there was an attempt made to create this town in Cairn, and it didn't succeed because the 1820s was not a good time. There was a famine, which was just as devastating in its effects as the Great Famine was to be later on. And secondly, of course, it was during the 1820s that O'Connell got involved in Catholic emancipation and he just didn't have time to be building new towns. Uh, but crucially, the people who were already living here in Carsveen wanted to stay here. And as delightful as Carn is, as we all know, they just simply wanted to stay where they were. They didn't want to move out to Carn. So therefore, as I have said, O'Connell abandoned his plans uh, to build a church on his lands, and therefore you have this church built, as I said, over here just outside. Now, because it was built very quickly to accommodate the parish at the time, it was not a very sturdy building and certainly was no architectural gem. And there are various accounts from the 1820s and 1830s of a building that was propped up with sleepers and with props. It was not a very safe place. But, but you see, all the parish, the parish needed a church. The other place was too small. So it served its purpose. Um, and it was, of course, O'Connell's church. When O'Connell passed this way on his way to Durianan, he worshipped in that church. As I said, it wasn't very sturdy, uh, but nonetheless, it was uh, what, what it was. It was the parish church, and as I said, remained so until 1902. As I said, the fact that O'Connell worshipped in that church over here was remembered in August 1882 when John Henry Foley's statue of Daniel O'Connell was unveiled in what is now O'Connell Street in Dublin, Sackville Street at that time, the big statue of O'Connell. That particular statue, as I said, was unveiled in August 1882, and it was the ambition, or it was the business, of a special committee that had been set up in 1862 called the O'Connell Monument Committee. And the business of the O'Connell Monument Committee was to build that statue. That statue was finally built and unveiled, as I have said, in August of 1882. And now that that was done, Canon Brosnan who, as I said, had come to Carcevina's parish priest in 1879, he hoped that now that the statue was built, that the O'Connell Monument Committee would adopt as a second project, as a second project, a plan to memorialize O'Connell in the form of a church which would be located here in his home parish at Carcevina. With an already high-powered national committee in place and the patronage of the Catholic hierarchy, Canon Brosnan believed that this could be put in place without too much trouble. It would be just like changing the notepaper head, if I could use a modern analogy. Indeed, the idea was endorsed by the main speaker, which was held at the banquet, which followed the unveiling of the statue. And in that speech, the main orator of the evening not only endorsed the idea of building a church in Carcevine, but as he described it, it should be, and I want to stress this point because many people forget this, it, as a national as a national memorial to O'Connell. O'Connell, the great champion of religious freedom the liberty, and liberty, 
all the world over. In other words, he was not just the son of Carr Sabine, he had changed the world. So that was a national project and an international, with an international remit. And Canon Brosnan was very pleased to hear his new church being described in this way. Because for him, the project to build the church was, and in many ways remained, a project which would be where the local, the need for a local church, the national and the international sort of blend together. So therefore, the building of this church, was orig as originally conceived, was not intended to be just a local matter. Instead, as I have said, it was where the local, the national, and the international coincided. As put by the Bishop of Kerry at the time, Dr. Andrew Higgins, and I quote, it seems only fitting that the place of the liberator's birth should be marked by some form of monument. And none seems more appropriate, he says, and none would be more useful than a memorial church. I am persuaded that the idea will attract sympathy from all directions. So again, he's thinking, he's thinking in big terms. And that generous support will enable you to realize it speedily. Then the bishop, of course, added his blessings to the work, as well as an undertaking that he would do all in his power, as he put it, to promote it. Bishop Higgins was not alone in his uh, endorsement. Although the O'Connell Monument Committee was dissolved, Canon Brosnan was satisfied that it had left an important legacy. And that legacy, as, I, as I've already said, was the view that the O'Connell Church, so-called, would be a national project. Indeed, two weeks after the O'Connell statue was unveiled in Dublin, Canon Brosnan began to receive a stream of subscriptions from all over the country. These subscriptions included one pound from Bishop Woodlock of Arda, which, as you will know, is in the west of Ireland. In his covering letter, Bishop Woodlock noted that one pound was all he could afford, as he said, parts of my diocese are very poor and I have many calls on my limited resources. But nonetheless, Canon Brosnan was not disappointed because for, Dan and, for Canon Brosnan, what mattered was not the size of the check, but the fact that by sending anything, the bishop was acknowledging that the proposed memorial church was a national project, that it was one which, regardless of where it was located, was for the hierarchy as a whole, not just for the Bishop of Kerry, and indeed certainly not for just Canon Brosnan, the parish priest, alone. With similar thoughts, uh, Canon Brosnan decided to publish the names and amounts of the subscriptions that he got, and they were published in the newspapers at the time, not to uh, cajole people into subscribing, but to highlight the wide geographical range of his supporters. And of course, they included a, any number of priests in all parts of uh, Kerry, any number of bishops and a number of others. But they also included donations from the people of Cahirsavine. Indeed, the November 1882 subscription list includes a range of subscriptions from nearly 60 people in Cahirsavine. In fact, it's a very interesting window into the social structure of Cahirsavine at the time. By April 1894, which is, uh, what was it, 12 years later, Canon Brosnan noted that by then, the town had contributed as much as 3,000 pounds, which was a lot of money at the time, but however, this 3,000 pounds was intended for the parish church. The people of the locality had a different view of the, of the church. For them, it was not about the lofty ambitions to build a national monument to Daniel O'Connell or had nothing to do with emancipation, or at least little to do with emancipation. It had to do with the fact that Carsevi needed a new parochial church and they wanted to replace the dilapidated one that was there and uh, to contribute to it accordingly. As I've said, therefore, um, Brosnan appreciated that there were two ways in which you could look to this church. There was the church as a national thing and as, an, as a, a, a national project and uh, as a, a parochial project. And as I've said before, as a result, the cost of his proposed church was not just one for Carr Savine, but, but it should be borne by, um, by, 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 by the country as a whole and indeed internationally. And that led him, of course, to look to the Irish diaspora and especially to the United States. And here again, Bishop uh, Higgins proved crucial because he released one of the curates in Carsevine, Father James Fitzgerald, who was curate here in the 1880s. He released him to travel to America and to promote the memorial church there. Father Fitzgerald duly sailed from Cove uh, for America in March 1883. However, after spending six months in America, Father Fitzgerald had managed only to raise 200 pounds. And this fell far short of what Canon Brosnan had hoped for. And this was because the proposed church was receiving 
only the lukewarm support of the American hierarchy. So therefore, we then have to ask ourselves, why was this the case? And in part, the attitude of the American hierarchy to the O'Connell Church and their lukewarm support was because um, the church, as it was being promoted by Father Fitzgerald, um, uh, was not named for a bishop, confessor, or martyr. Churches at that time, and the canon lawyers here might correct me, a church had to be named, and I quote, for a, con for a bishop, a confessor, or a martyr of the Catholic Church. And of course, O'Connell was none of these. So therefore, some of the American bishops felt uncomfortable about being asked to support a project which was to be named for a layman, however distinguished a layman he was. However, instead of arguing the niceties of canon law with eminent American bishops, the ever practical canon Brazen decided to visit Rome, where in November and December 1883, the American bishops were having their ad limina meeting with Pope Leo XIII. Now, the ad limina visits take place, I think it's either five or every 10 years, I'm not being a canon lawyer, I don't know, it's either five or 10 years, and it's where the hierarchy of a particular country would visit the Pope and they would spend in an intensive period of time with him reflecting on and discussing and considering the affairs of that particular hierarchy, which is the Irish hierarchy, the British hierarchy, the American hierarchy, or whatever. And it was the turn of the Americans, as I said, to come in um, November and December 1883 to go on there and limit a visit. So this proved, of course, to be an inspired move. Canon Brazen had them all in Rome, and so therefore, instead of trying trying to confront the American bishops on their own turf, he would go off to Rome. And there, armed with letters of introduction from leading Catholic figures, including Bishop Higgins, Archbishop Croke of Cashel and Cardinal Manning of Westminster, Brosnan arrived in Rome in November 1883. But again, instead of opening discussions with the American bishops and trying to make a case to the American bishops, he decided he would go one step higher, like moving from here to there. Uh, and he decided he wanted to have an audience with the Pope. Now, Brosnan's audience with the Pope, about which most people in this town know something, it was arranged through Dr. Kirby, the very influential rector of the Irish College in Rome, most, one of the most influential figures in the history of 19th century Catholic Ireland, even though he was based in um, Rome. And that interview with the Pope took place on the 10th of December, 1883. Now, from his own work in Rome and his own contacts in Rome, Dr. Kirby knew that O'Connell was not a strange name to the Pope. Because as a member of the Vatican Diplomatic Service, uh, Archbishop Pecci, as Pope Leo XIII was known at the time, Archbishop Pecci, um, was a papal nuncio to Belgium between 1843 and 1846. Now, the nunciature in Brussels, in Belgium, was actually quite an important place and quite an important assignment at this time because there was no resident nuncio in England and hadn't been for centuries. There was no resident nuncio in Ireland. So therefore, the nunciature in uh, Brussels had responsibility, if you like, for the affairs of England and Ireland. So therefore, as soon as uh, Pecci arrived in Brussels, he was making arrangements to go to London to do his tour and meet the bishops like any papal nuncio would do even um, uh, today. And as I said, he went to England, and while he was in England in 1846, he visited the House of Commons, and it so happened that the day he visited the House of Commons, and I don't know if this was contrived or not, but it's certainly a matter of fact, that the day he went to Westminster, he saw O'Connell giving a speech. And it was, it was often the case with parliamentary debates, even still, where there's a lot of barracking going on, and a lot of taunting, and a lot of heckling going on. And O'Connell was hecked heckled and taunted from the well of the House of Commons. And this image quite, did never quite um, left uh, Pecci. And so therefore, no sooner was uh, Canon Brosnan in the Pope's um, company, because by now he'd become Pope, as I've said, that he talked about that uh, visit to um, the House of Commons uh, and seeing O'Connell. And because of the impression that it made on him, he was more than willing to endorse uh, Brosnan's project. And to underline that support, he announced that he would donate a cornerstone for the proposed church, and he asked Archbishop Croke to lay it in his name. He also gave Canon Brosnan a piece of marble from the catacombs, on which are sculpted the words of the Pope's approval, which, by the way, our visitors might note, can be viewed just inside the tower door here over to my left. More crucially, however, and this was the important point, the Pope also announced that the new church should be known, and as I quote, 
I am quoting the Pope here, not entering into controversy, the O'Connell Memorial Church of the Holy Cross, Cahirstavin, unquote. Or informally, and again I quote from the Pope, the O'Connell Church. Therefore, as the Pope himself put it, the new church would be, as he put it, in honor of the Holy Cross, but it would be a monument to Daniel O'Connell. Now, there is a classic squaring of the circle, if ever there was one, but that is the way the Pope put it. The Pope's endorsement was quite significant because it changed Brosnan's fortunes, not least, of course, because it removed any reservations which canon lawyers had about the name of the, um, of the church. And among those was Cardinal Newman. Now, Cardinal Newman, who, of course, is now a saint, as you know, was an extremely influential uh, member of the church at the time, uh, especially at this time, because he was coming to the end of his life. And aware that the Pope had endorsed the um, project in this way, he wrote to Canon Brosnan in March 1884, saying that if there was anything he could do uh, to promote the church, that he would do so. He also sent five pounds. But again, for Brosnan, it was a, the important thing was not the five pounds, but that he had taken the trouble to write in the first place. And so therefore, with these kinds of endorsements from these eminent people, the Pope and, um, and uh, Cardinal Newman, little wonder that when Canon Brosnan returned to Cahirstavine from Rome in March 1884, it was reported, and I quote, that the townspeople turned out in hundreds to greet their pastor. The town was illuminated, tar barrels were lit, and the streets paraded by an immense crowd. Six months later, Father Fitzgerald returned from America to a similar reception, but in this case, he was armed with 2,300 pounds in pledges and subscriptions. So clearly, the American bishops had overcome their reservations, and the endorsement of the Pope was quite important. Indeed, Father Fitzgerald's success in America led Canon Brosnan to ask the bishop to agree to a separate fundraising admission, this time to Australia. And he sent two curates, Father Dennis O'Reardon, who at that time was curate at Bohrbui, and later to become parish priest here, and Father Michael Kelleher, who at that time was a curate at Drummond. And Father O'Reardon and Father Kelleher both left for, America, for Australia in July 1884. En route, they too met the Pope, and the Pope told both of these priests that he wished, and I quote, he wished, and I quote, that all Irishmen and Catholics would help us to build that church and to make it worthy of the great man in whose memory it was to be erected. So again, another papal endorsement there. Canon Brosnan was less successful in Britain, and although he did receive some support from Britain, especially from Cardinal Manning, as I mentioned earlier on, um, the Catholic Church in England in the last maybe 40 years of the 19th century was in the middle of a huge building program. And however much they admired O'Connell, and O'Connell was crucial actually in the fortunes of uh, Catholics in England, regardless of all of that, um, they had very little resources uh, to be um, constructing or contributing to the construction of a church in the southwest of Ireland. Nonetheless, all of this activity was enough to have Canon Brosnan ask his architect, George Ashland, to proceed from what I call the planner's table to the builder's, to the builder's site. And in May 1886, this was possible after a contract was awarded to John Devlin of Glasgow, a firm which, despite the fact that it was located in Glasgow, they were originally of Tyrone and were well got within Catholic networks in Britain at that time, and as it had undertaken similar projects in parts of England and Ireland, and they were not by any means inexperienced in projects of this kind. Devlin and Brosnan agreed that the projected cost of the building would be about £25,000, a lot of money, and that there should be seating for 2,000 people. And so the work commenced. By January 1888, that is 18 months into the project, the foundations had been laid and the foundations were dressed. The outer walls were 18 feet over floor level by January 1888. And work on this nave here, this is the central part of the church, which was 152 feet long, work on the nave, the semicircular apse where we are here, and the transepts over here to the right and left, work on them was about to begin. But nonetheless, Canon Brosnan worried a lot about these projects because um, he, he, even though he had 5,000 pounds in the bank and had many um, promises of more, um, he knew that it would only carry him so far. You know, it was a case of a, 
of a priest worrying that his project was moving too fast. Most of us worry about the fact that they move too closely, slowly, but in this case, he was worried it was moving too fast. And he knew that he didn't have enough resources to, to keep up with uh, the building speed that was going on. And also, a lot of the money that he had was not in hand, you know? It's all very promising money to any project, but if you don't have it in hand, it's very difficult to convince builders uh, to hold on a second. You know, the money will be coming in, the money, and I, I promise Rena, builders aren't impressed by that kind of thing. So therefore, uh, Buchanan worried about his flow of funds. It's also important to remember that other than the cost of building this church, that he had other demands on his pocket. For example, as soon as Ashland drew up uh, the designs for the church, um, Canon Brosnan, before he paid any builder, he had to pay 1,600 pounds to Trinity College because, as I said, Trinity College owned the town at this stage and he did not want to cite his Catholic church, this tribute to a Catholic tribune, did not want it uh, secured on Trinity land. So therefore, that was quite a lot of money. And there were various other examples of money that was eating into his capital. So therefore, it was necessary, as he put it, to keep up the work of the collection in a thorough fashion. So he decided to do what he hadn't done up to now, and that was to appeal directly and more coherently and in a more organized way to the people of Ireland. As I said, he would be reluctant to appeal to people in Ireland up to now because of the bad times, really, of the 1880s, the famine and the post-famine of the 1880s. But he said, with the tr as trade was improving, he said, I doubt if the people of Ireland, no matter what demands may be on them otherwise, would allow this great religious and national monument to be halted at the present. The canon also asked his fellow parish priests in the uh, diocese to allow him to give a sermon in their respective parishes, which might raise money for the proposed memorial church. And much like the collections that are sometimes taken up today for parishes which are less fortunate than others, that he might be allowed to take up a special collection, as these are called. Some parish priests obliged, faced with their own bills, some did not. But having said that, the majority, the vast, the overwhelming majority of priests in Kerry certainly subscribed as individuals, not once, not twice, but sometimes several times over, and often in very generous amounts. This was also true of some of, some of the bishops. In Cloyne, for example, where of course our former parish priest, Dr. Billy Crean, is currently bishop, his predecessor, the then bishop, Dr. John McCarthy, contributed generously, although his own cathedral in Cove, that wonderful building there, which I'm sure some of you have, wonderful cathedral in Cove, was 12,000 pounds in debt at the time. So did several parish priests, many of whom organized parish collections at the time, uh, despite the fact, as I said, that there are other demands on their resources. For all that, however, Canon Brosnan continued to be troubled by the flow of funds, and he hoped that the visit of Archbishop Croke on the 1st of uh, August, 1888, to lay the foundation stone, that that might change his fortunes. By August, 1888, when Archbishop Croke came, the first phase of the project, that is the construction of the outer walls here to roof level, that was almost complete. And the second phase of the project, that is to say the completion of the nave, that is again the central part of the church, that was underway. Two years later, in August 1891, Canon Brosnan could also report that while the walls of the nave and the aisles, in other words, what's often called as core, the superstructure of the building, um, was, uh, was, was, was up to its full height, as I've said, the chancel, the apse, the transepts, uh, and also the preparation of the building for the roof. It's one thing having the, the, the outer walls, but well, you have to prepare them to take the roof. And as I said, he was uh, troubled by this. He was troubled that the building would stall in some way or other, despite the fact that to all intents and purposes, it was proceeding under, uh, it was just proceeding on fine. And at the same time as all this was happening, the old church located out here was deteriorating. And as the Irish Times, no less, put it in April 1888, it was becoming day by day more unsuitable for public worship, if not dangerous to the congregation. It does not afford sufficient accommodation, and on Sundays and holidays, numbers may be seen in all weathers kneeling outside its walls. Another paper writing in 1889 reported that the walls of the old church were, as he put it, being propped up with sleepers. So therefore, all of this led Canon Brosnan to redouble his efforts and to look at new ways of raising money. 
Among these new networks, and I'm mentioning this for a reason that will come clear in a minute, among these networks were the teachers. The teachers were ext becoming extraordinarily influential during the 1880s and the 1890s. And of course, the teachers were at that time, as they are still today, represented by the Irish National Teachers Organization, the INTO. And the, among the founders of the INTO was a man called Charles Brennan, who was principal of the primary school out in Cairn, the school that I mentioned earlier on. And he was widely known and widely respected within the country, not just within the, the parish here, not just within the diocese, but within the country. And he was a person who now used these networks to promote the memorial church through the school system. So there was another uh, revenue stream come here. I might just say that one of those, uh, I don't know which one it is now, but one of those windows up here was, uh, is dedicated to his memory, uh, to, to uh, um, Charles Brennan's uh, uh, memory. I had the great pleasure of showing one of his, uh, his let me see one of it, his grand, great granddaughter around the church here about three or four years ago. She came down to see that. She's married to Michael McDougall, by the way. I don't know if that's re relevant or not, but anyway. Uh, so in addition to the, INT, the INTO um, networks, there were also any number of concerts, football tournaments, and even what was described as a grand bazaar, as it was described, uh, held to raise money. This grand bazaar was held up in the marketplace, market house up in the eastern part of the town, which is now where the, um, the uh, garage is located. There, people could buy tickets and win prizes, and if they could not attend in person, they could have their tickets entered into the various draws. So this is kind of an early version of Lotto, if you like. So for all that, however, and despite all of this activity, he was running into, Canon Brosnan was running into trouble with his builders, because unfortunately, Devlin died in late, in late 1890. And because he died, the executors were looking at his estate, as they always do in these circumstances, and they noted that, um, Devlin had not been paid for several months and whatever about getting the support of builders and getting them to postpone it for another week and another week and another week, you're not going to get very, very far with lawyers or accountants. So therefore, they insisted on Canon Brosnan to agree on a, a payment plan. They were not impressed by Canon Brosnan's arguments that um, uh, times were bad and you know all this money promised and it'll come in tomorrow. They were not impressed by that they wanted a payment plan. But of course, Canon Brosnan wasn't in a position to agree because he didn't have money to hand. And so therefore, work on the Memorial Church was halted in May 1893. And it remained halted for the following three and a half years, exposed to the elements and so forth. Now, there was nothing Canon Brosnan could do about this except to redouble his efforts to raise money, to try and get enough money in the bank to create a cash flow with the builders. And this was eventually successful, and work recommenced in the, uh, on the church in early 1897. But unfortunately, it had taken a great toll on Canon Brosnan's health, who kind of didn't have a great committee or a great structure. He wasn't a great man for having committees and organizations before reinforcing him. But the colorality of that, of course, was that he, a lot of that administration fell on himself. So um, the result is his health did, he began to decline, and he died on the 21st of December, 1898. And although his beloved church had not yet been completed, he was, as you know, buried within his precincts, and he's buried over here to my right, and I know our bishop will lay a wreath on his uh, grave later on. By any standards, if you look at that, um, it really amazes me every time I come in here, some of those, just, if you're, it's amazing uh, that in, in such an unpretentious place, uh, such an important figure in the history of our church is buried, you know. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, I remember him, as I said earlier, I remember him in this year of 2023 because it marks the 200th anniversary of his birth. And we remember him not just as a priest, but as somebody who influenced the history of South Kerry in all kinds of <coughs> ways. As I mentioned, when um, Canon Brosnan was interred over here, in December 1898, the church had not been completed. And that task fell to his two successors. And they were both named O'Reardon, and they sometimes get confused. The first was um, a man called Dennis Reardon, uh, who served as parish priest here between April 1889 and September 1900. And then Canon Humphrey O'Reardon, who served here from 1900 to 1913. His grave is right inside the um, main uh, gate as you come in there over to the, the, the right to the left. So it, it was up to these two people to complete what Canon Brosnan had, um, had done. And because they were relatively younger men, 
Um, and because in one case, uh, Canon Reir Dennis Reardon had already been in America collecting money, so he knew the scene. <coughs> they just took to this with gusto. And he reported, he reported to his congregation that nearly £5,000 was needed to complete the project in order to bring it up to a suitable position for, for roofing. That £1,600 was needed for grinding the ceilings in stone and concrete. And that £2,800 was needed for the sacristy, the doors, the porches, the flooring, the plastering, the glazing, and then what was called the nun's tribune. So therefore, it was a big task, you know. But with the aid of a loan from the Munster and Leinster Bank, for which a number of Catholic merchants became sureties, and an intensive campaign of public subscriptions, Canon Reardon, or Reardon, proceeded with gusto. He was aware, as he said himself, that he was going back to the same well, so to speak, but he added that this would be definitely the final appeal, and that his supporters should contribute with that in mind. There was another trip to America, this time undertaken by the canon himself. He left for America in November 1899. Uh, However, although the canon was well received in America, he was not well, and on medical advice, he was asked to return to Ireland in May 1900. However, he was able to tell his parishioners <coughs> that in that short time as parish priest, <coughs> he had raised enough money to, ra to, to leave a ba bank balance for his successor of nearly 2,500 pounds in the bank. And that successor was Canon Humphrey Reardon, who arrived, as I said, in 1900. For his own part, Canon Dennis O'Reardon, as I said, was in ill health, and he asked the bishop to reassign him back home to his own uh, diocese, what was at that time called King Williamstown, it's now called Valley Desmond, and there he remained as parish priest for a number of years. But in the meantime, Canon Humphrey O'Reardon uh, proceeded to complete the uh, project. And indeed, he was also very energetic and very inventive in the ways he went about saving money. And as a result of it, and finally after so many starts and stops, the first mass in this church was celebrated on the 14th of December, 1902, by Father Timothy O'Sullivan, a priest from Filemore who worked in the Archdiocese of um, Westminster at the time and who was, happened to be at home visiting his relations. But having said that, however, despite the fact that we know that the first mass was um, held in December 1902, there was no grand ceremony of dedication or consecration, and I don't know if anybody, if there has been one since, because the fact of the matter is that the church wasn't really in a fit, and remains so for about 20 or 30 years, it wasn't a fit place to, to, to have such a grand ceremony if uh, a, grand, a grand ceremony of that kind. As I said, the canon Humphrey O'Riordan wanted to get out of that old church. He, that's what he, that was his aim. And if this was sufficiently robust, if this building was sufficiently robust uh, to host masses, then so be it. He would go and come here. And that's why a priest uh, wrote in July 1905, and I quote, the church in Cahersville now as it stands is only partly finished. There are no, none of the interior appointments, no altars, no communion rail, no organ gallery, nor pulpit, and the interior roof has yet to be provided. The tower and the spire must still be built, and as you know, they were subsequently abandoned. In brief, nothing is finished but the magnificent, magnificent shell itself. But as I said, it was enough for at least to give people shelter that they could worship in, um, in um, safety. <coughs> Nonetheless, progress was made. 1904, for example, the canon, Canon O'Reardon, was willed 60 pounds to pay for a life-size crucifix which hangs there. That is where that came from, and I know it was refurbished when Canon Larry came here. The following year, 1905, two priests, Father Harty of Drummond and, canon, and Father Daniel Finucane of Cahar Daniel, left to spend yet another 18-month trip to America, uh, which actually ended up in helping to clear the debt almost completely. The organ up here, was added in 1905, and as late as 1904, we had to wait until 1904 before the mortuary was added, which is down here on the right-hand side, which is now a shop. So over the years as well, the church also received gifts of altar vestments and gifts of various sacred vessels. Even the marble slab, which is over Canon Brasnan's vault here, that had to wait until 1914 because there wasn't enough money around, you know, for it to, these sorts of things. And even though, as I said, this is an impressive uh, building, it still has an air of kind of being incomplete, you know. So they didn't have money, as I said, to bring these, uh, these things to uh, a close. But in any event, as I have said, <coughs> um, 
let me come back to where I began, and I'm going to close now. Um, the church, this church, as I said, meant different things over the years to different people. It was a parish church, as I said, and for us who live and who worship here, it is a parish church. But also for so many others, it is a national and an international monument to the lives and achievements of Daniel O'Connell. And it is a tall order, I would suspect, for any parish priest, and I expect it remains a tall order for, for Brosnan's successors. Secondly, when the project to build this church uh, was mooted in the 1870s and 1880s, it celebrated not only O'Connell, but what uh, Archbishop Crow called when he came here in um, August 1888, it celebrated uh, O'Connell's commitment to what he called the constitutional as opposed to the physical force mode of securing political and social progress. Now, you don't meet, need, me, me, need me to tell you that as you're coming up to 1916, not everybody agreed with that. And indeed, of course, by then, there was an alternative discourse to O'Connell O'Connell's pacifism coming to the fore that was represented by the United Irishmen and the physical force tradition. And they had their own platform because in 1898 was the centenary of the 1798 rebellion. And so therefore there were moves to uh, erect monuments in memory of the 1798 rebellion and by extension to Wolf Tone and by extension to that tradition in Irish, Irish history. But Canon O'Reardon su suggested that for all that, the, the memorial church dedicated to O'Connell had, as he called it, a first claim in the pockets of the people of Kerry, but it did open this important debate, which still exists in all kinds of forms today, between um, the O'Connell and Wolf Tone, between constitutionalism and militarism as an aspect of <coughs> Irish history. But having said that, however, Canon O'Reardon, when he came here as parish priest um, in the early years of the 20th century, he said he wasn't getting into the, uh, I mean, he wanted people to contribute to finish his church, but he wasn't interested in getting involved in philosophical debates about Irish nationalism. And he said that there were pros and cons on both sides. In other words, as far as he was concerned, in 1902, in the early years of the 20th century, uh, the memorial church, although it was dedicated to O'Connell, uh, was one that would embrace all kinds of opinions, the pros and cons of all aspects of um, of Irish nationalism. Finally, as I mentioned twice, I think already, this year marks, as I said, the 200th anniversary of the birth of um, Canon Brosnan. <coughs> and, um, and I really can't stress this strong enough, really, uh, and certainly not in a ch church I'm aware of, I'm in a sacred place, so I certainly wouldn't overstress it, but these were remarkable, absolutely remarkable people. Um, whom we remember here today, not just as priests who contributed to our, the history of our town and the history of our parish and the history of our diocese, but who contributed in all sorts of ways uh, to making life better for their parishioners, in negotiating in particular with our landlords under the, when the um, land acts were being discussed, negotiating on beh their behalf with their landlords, leading the campaign for the railway, for example. Canon Brosnan chaired that committee, and, uh, and we eventually, the railway came down in 1893, and of course, it came down from Kilogland, down to Carsimine, and down to Valencia. Canon Brosnan chaired that committee. Again, these priests chaired the relief committees and involved themselves in all, kind, all kinds of uh, schemes. As I said, I could talk not only about Father Brosnan, but I could also talk about Father Lawler in Kilogland. Father Lawler, um, was parish priest in Valencia before he went to um, uh, Kilogland in 1884 and built the church, of course, there in uh, that lovely church there, St. James's Church in um, Kilogland. Uh, similarly, you have Father John Casey in Valencia, Father Quilter in Glenbe. Again, these names, I'm sure, mean nothing, I would suspect, to all of you. But these were remarkable, absolutely remarkable people. Nearer to my own time, of course, um, another remarkable priest uh, was Monsignor uh, Hugh O'Flaherty, <coughs> the Scarlet Pimpernel of the Vatican, as he is called, who saved so many lives during the Second World War, and a man who, I might say, from time to time I served Mass as an altar boy over there in St. Mary's, uh, in St. Mary's uh, altar. But the thing, I mention him here because um, he died in Cahar Sabine uh, 60 years ago this coming Monday. So we're going to remember him as well as Canon Brosnan later on. So in conclusion, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I'm doing okay in time. Uh, um, this, as I said, is an impressive place, an impressive place by any standards. Um, it is a big
big place, an impressive place. But as I said at the beginning, it was always intended to impress people. But Canon Brosnan knew that when he took it on, really, that he took on a big project. It was both a parish church and a national church. And in a sense, it was very difficult for the two to jive together. But as we approach the 200th anniversary of Catholic emancipation in 2029, I hope that these same national networks uh, uh, that contributed so much to realizing the Daniel O'Connell Memorial Church of the Holy Cross, that those same national networks will become part of our story here in trying to um, renovate and uh, keep our uh, church. Uh, and it's a big assignment, I, I know that, but to try and keep it as beautiful uh, as, as, it, as it should be. And with that, here endeth my lecture. Thank you very much. Now, as Father, as Father Larry said at the beginning, I'm conscious of the fact that um, even though this is Tiga Fabel, the people's place, I'm conscious of the fact that uh, really I'm where I am in the sanctuary here. So I, in deference to where I am, I, would, I, won't, I won't take questions, but I'd be happy to discuss anything with people afterwards. Uh, the second thing I mentioned, of course, was that um, we will be celebrating um, the 200th anniversary of Catholic emancipation in 2029. And in 1929, when the 400th anniversary of that um, uh, event took place, there were very impressive ceremonies held all over, all over the country. And there was a very impressive um, ceremony, ser anniversary and uh, ceremonial took place here in Carcevine in um, 1929. And there was a flag that was commissioned as part of those ceremonies, which was held for uh, several years. It was in the custodianship of um, Noreen O'Connell from the Irish House. Uh, and as you know, Noreen O'Connell, probably some of you, of course, most of you, I'm sure, knew her, uh, died there recently at the age of 103. Uh, and lived a, it was a great, she used to attend mass every day sitting over there, that was her pew there. But anyway, she had this, uh, she had this uh, um, flag and the executors of her estate have uh, decided to offer this flag, which was used in the uh, commemoration ceremonies in 1929, to the, back to the church. So I'm now going to ask Annette O'Connell and uh, Mary Murphy to bring the flag up and to present it to Father Larry. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Millish, for a lovely talk, a lovely lecture on Canon uh, Timothy Braston, and also on the building of this uh, beautiful church and how it developed uh, in the early years. And just, uh, I know many of you have been interested in with uh, the upkeep of the church, etc. You, you, I think you all know we've had trouble in the church for many years with water coming in from the outside. And that water was not coming from the roof, it was coming in through the walls. And thankfully, we now have a, have a dry church and the work will begin on the interior of the church in the coming year. And as late as last Friday, I had a meeting with the conservation architect, uh, the mechanical and electrical engineers who will be working on the building and also our parish building committee. 
and we are very confident by that by this time next year, some of the work of the interior work will be done. We will probably begin with the heating, uh, probably look at the electrical work, uh, sound system, uh, wheelchair, wheelchair access, uh, uh, toilets, and so on. So um, just let you know that that will be happening in the very near future. We are ready almost to go naturally. You know, it, all these things take time. But, uh, and as you can see, as you drive into Car Savine, there was a huge debt in this church uh, just a, few, uh, a short number of years, uh, years ago. But thankfully, because of the generosity of you, of the parishioners of Car Savine, and those with Car Savine roots, and those who have interest in Car Savine, that um, debt came down very, very quickly. And we're ready now to begin the interior, the interior works of the church. So again, thank you all for your, your generosity. All that's left to be done now is uh, I'll ask Father our Bishop Ray Brown to lay two wreaths, uh, one on the, over here, if our Canon Broston is, Broston is laid to rest. And the second one will be in the grave, the grave of Monsignor Hugh Flaherty, who many, whom you all know is buried on the, church, on the church grounds. And in fact, the actual date of his, of his death was, I think, the 30th of October, 60 years next Monday. So it couldn't have been closer to... So we have the, the, so Monsignor Flaherty, uh, once in a few of that, who died 60 years ago next Monday, and Canon Brosnan, who was born 200 years ago. So it was a very appropriate time to have this lecture in this church. So I'll, I'll invite now uh, Bishop Ray Brown to lay the wreath, and you may go. You may follow. You may you may go, go with him if you wish. You can come this way if you wish, and you follow him out to the. This one will be going on uh, Monsignor Hugh Flaherty's grave and this one on uh, Canon Brussels. 